Good afternoon, Fighting Scots. My name is Jordan Sherpy Lencioni, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Monmouth College. I want to welcome everyone this afternoon for our next Golden Scots event, Exhibit Tours of the Putnam Museum, with some of our curators that are on right now. We're very thrilled that everyone is able to join us this afternoon. Before we begin, just to cover a few housekeeping items, today's event will be recorded and available on the Monmouth College website next week. For the best viewing experience, we recommend that you put your computer into speaker mode, which is located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. At the end of the event, we will enable audio and video so that you're able to show yourself and ask questions to our curators at the end. We will see three exhibits this afternoon, play the story of toys, birds and you and unearthing ancient Egypt. Each tour has been pre recorded and will be shown one after another. At the end of today's event, you'll also see a short three minute survey appear in your web browser and then you'll receive a more comprehensive survey next week in your email. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am going to turn off uh, my screen. So um, Putnam, if you want to turn off yours, you're welcome to and I will share the video at this time. Hello, Fighting Scots. I'm Rachel Mullins, President and CEO of the Putnam Museum and Science Center. We're a museum of history, culture, and science serving the Quad Cities region for over 150 years. As a Smithsonian institution, we house an incredible collection of artifacts spanning many, many generations of collectors here in the Quad Cities region. The collection and your tour today will represent ethnographic material from around the world, our regional history, the natural sciences, our local river and prairie ecosystems and much more. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy the Putnam. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Chandler. I'm the Curator of Natural Science here at the Putnam Museum and I'm welcoming you to our Birds and You exhibit at the Putnam. One of the things we're often asked about this exhibit is why did we do it in the first place and it all is due to uh, a recent report that came out in 2019 that explained that in the last 50 years we have pretty much lost something like three billion birds in the United States. That's one in four birds, and it's not just weird, exotic birds. It's the birds you see every day at your feeders and around your house. It's quite a frightening statistic. So we wanted to talk about the things that we could do, what people could do, to help keep the birds with us, that we wouldn't lose them all. all. Um, so one of the interesting things we do with this exhibit is we're, we're not just uh, talking about the gloom and doom of, yes, that's a terrible statistic, but it's also talking about how, what we can do to preserve our birds and what we can do as individuals. Um, so we're going to go and, and look at some of the things we have around the exhibit to help you um, look at some of the possibilities of things we can do. Uh, one of the things I like to show first, of course, is that uh, we have, because we're an old enough museum, we have actually have passenger pigeons in our collection. And if you're familiar with the passenger pigeon, it's an extinct bird from North America. Basically, it's these beautiful pigeons. They're very iridescent, very gorgeous looking up close. They actually used to exist in the millions, possibly billions, in the United States and North America. And within probably about 200 years of us starting to shoot them and to take away their habitat, they became extinct. It was one of those things where people thought, my gosh, there's so many of them, how would they ever go extinct? Well, we found out we could easily do that. And that's sort of like what we're talking about for this exhibit is that these are birds that are going uh, that we are losing that are everyday birds that you see them every day. So what well, we don't want you to be as complacent about it, that they need our help. And so that's what we're going to try and do with this exhibit. So one of the aspects of this exhibit is discussing the things that we can do as individuals or as groups to help birds. Um, things that you can do to prevent birds from um, ending up dying unnecessarily. So. Uh, some of the things you might think of, it's pretty simple, is like how do you prevent birds from hitting your windows? Well, there's all sorts of things you can put in your windows to keep birds from actually hitting windows. Um, other things you can do is learn about birdscaping, which is basically making your landscape less like a golf course and more like what it would look naturally, so planting natural plants or something that you might do. It doesn't take a lot, actually, to help birds. Even things like not raking your yard up and getting rid of your leaves. Just leave the leaves on the ground or, uh, or bank them somewhere because those leaves actually in the winter help keep the, the insects alive that the birds like to eat. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Uh, some fun things we did actually, it's kind of reminiscent of what we used to do at the Putnam 
is that we asked people to send in, um, loan us, birdhouses. So we went for both whimsical and practical, and we have some really fun ones here. There's things made out of gourds. There's one made out of an old boot, even. I'm not sure. The boot, I actually know, has been used by birds because the person who loaned it told us that they had to clean it out before we got it. Um, but it's also reminiscent of things we used to do when we were the, when we were the Academy of Natural Science, um, the Davenport Academy of Natural Science here in Davenport. Um, the picture in the background is actually from an early birdhouse contest they did in the early 1900s, which I thought it was kind of a great background drop for what we were doing now. So you can do things like birdhouses, there's things, basically birds need what we need, it's food, shelter, and uh, water. So you know, having a, uh, a bird bath is great, uh, putting out a feeder is great, we talk about different types of food that most like different birds like, um, and then also the idea of, of building shelters for them. One of the interesting things I learned that I didn't know at the time when I first started uh, looking into this was that most birdhouses you really don't want to perch on it. Um, because most birds can manage without the perch, and the perch actually gives uh, uh, different animals that might be attacking birds a chance to get into their birdhouse. So all sorts of interesting things you learned that you didn't know before. So a few other things you can do to help um, save birds in your area is um, one simple one is keep cats indoors because uh, cats actually even though a well-fed cat often will go after a bird, and uh, so we always suggest that you keep your cats indoors for the sake of birds. Uh, avoid pesticides. Pesticides don't just kill the pests like the bugs, but they often get into um, the birds and cause issues. Uh, everybody remembers the story of DDT, which was a pesticide used to, I believe, kill things like mosquitoes, and unfortunately had a really bad reaction when it got into birds. The, the birds' eggs actually became so thin that they couldn't sit on the eggs. Um, which is why it's banned in the U.S. Uh, other possible things you might think about that you might not really know, uh, things like if you have a grocery store, ask them if they have shade-grown coffee because there's a really big difference between what shade-grown coffee, the habitat it develops as opposed to when you have these farms where the coffee uh, really has little or no habitat at all for birds. So things like that. Um, one of the main things we like to promote here is getting up off the couch and doing something about it. So one of the cool things is, uh, and this is what we talk a lot about, being a citizen science scientist. And with birds, that's one of the groups that there are all sorts of possibilities, all sorts of projects out there that you can join. Uh, everything from um, the, the Christmas bird count that Audubon has done for, gosh, over 100 years now, uh, to all sorts of things by other places, like there's a bird feeder watch where you can literally just go and look out your window at the, the birds at your feeder and, and register what you find. Uh, just the, last week, we had the um, Global Bird Day, basically, where um, they asked people to go out and, and just observe what birds they could see. And then you actually go to websites and you uh, log in what you've seen. Uh, that gives uh, people who study birds a lot better idea of what's happening to birds. That was one of the coolest things about the study that uh, came out in 2019. They didn't just look at uh, scientific documentation. They literally looked at everything, including all those bird counts from all these different years. They used radar. They did all sorts of things to actually come up with the large data set that they used. Uh, one of the things that we need to do if we're going to do a bird count, though, of course, is we need to be able to identify the birds. So that's one of the reasons in this exhibit we have a large selection of birds that are found here around the Quad Cities. So, and we have them set up so that you, uh, they're set up by season, like when you're uh, liable to see them, when you're probably going to see them in, in the wild, because obviously not all birds stay here all year. Some birds are here all year, some are just here in the summer, some are just here in the fall and the spring. So we have it set up so that uh, in their cases that are set for uh, how likely you are to see them. So uh, the case I'm in front of, it has both winter and summer residents. The winter residents include things like the snowy owls, which by the way, are really quite rare in our area here in the Quad Cities, but they come around enough that I actually felt that they should go in the case. And plus everybody, anyway, who's driving around really sees them when they see them, they're, they're really obvious. So in the Quad Cities, we're very lucky because we're actually sitting on the Mississippi River Flyway. Uh, it's a, basically the pathway that, you think of it a highway going from the south um, all the way up into the Arctic, and you get birds that fly all, uh, every year coming through, uh, going to their breeding grounds in the north. So because we're on this flyway, we actually get to see lots and lots of birds that other people wouldn't see. Uh, we also, it's interesting with us, 
is that we're on just that edge of the Mississippi, so we're sort of like in between the eastern and western groups of birds, so we get a little mix of those too. But of course, because we're on the flyway, what we get a lot of is waterfowl, and so one of the fun things was getting out um, examples of all of our wonderful waterfowl, including things like the you know the great blue heron that everybody sees because they know it because even when you see it in flight, it's it's got such an interesting silhouette that you always know when you see it, uh, and that was one of the things we like to do here is uh, by having these animals out here for you to see, you'll have a better idea of what to look for if you're actually trying to identify birds. So one of the interesting things we have um, on display here is um, eider ducks. They're actually ducks from the Arctic area of North America. Uh, we like to joke about how we have a lot of things in common with birds and, birds, and one of those things is liking to nest, our need to nest. <laughs> um, and that's one of those things that brings us uh, closer to birds if you think about it. There are birds that nest that just scrape out a little, you know, just a little hole in the ground and, and lay their eggs. And then there are birds like the eiders, which they live where it's really quite cold. And what they do is they literally pluck the down out of their, out of their chest and they make a wonderful nest out of it. And if you've ever had an eider coat or, or an eider quilt, um, you'll know how incredibly warm that is. That is really, really warm down. And so they make this nest out of it. It's a wonderful nest, it's warm. And they literally, because of the way it's made, they can literally, if they leave the nest, they can kind of pull it over top, almost like a blanket on top of their eggs, which is great. And the interesting thing is uh, that people have actually been farming eider uh, humanely for centuries. Basically what they do is they uh, put up uh, places for them to nest. Uh, the birds go through their breeding and nesting and when they leave, they leave that wonderful eider down sitting there and then the people just can come in and actually take it and they never have to disturb the birds or anything. So it's a wonderful way of, of you know, reusing something that nature gives us. So one of the more interesting cases I have here is set up to basically talk about how different birds um, have different colored plumage. And one of the interesting things about birds, of course, is that the males often are much more brightly colored and have greater feathers, greater, more interesting feathers than the females. Um, we have a male and female uh, ring neck pheasant in here that you can see how she's kind of just a dull brown and he's got all those little feathers. But the fun thing is, you know, we always talk about this, is that it's a female choice when it comes to uh, birds. So, Females like to look at the prettiest male and say, ha, oh, he must be really healthy and therefore he's going to be my mate so I have really healthy uh, chicks. But the problem is it's not just the females who like those feathers. Uh, during the 1800s there was this incredible craze for bird feathers on hats and literally hunters would go out and kill thousands of birds just to have it so women could have them on their heads. Um, I've seen pictures not just of feathers on, but they literally would put a dead stuffed bird on a hat, which is just beyond me. I, I don't quite understand that. Um, so one of the reasons we have the Migratory Bird Treaty in place that we do that um, helps protect birds is because we're trying to stop things like that, try to stop people from uh, going crazy and shooting all these birds just for their feathers. Uh, there's another in, in instance where feathers are quite um, the thing. Apparently in Victorian salmon flies, you know, the flies you tie to catch your salmon fish, um, they used all sorts of crazy exotic birds and there is now a black market in those types of bird feathers. Unfortunately, most of those birds are, are endangered or threatened and therefore you can't get them legally. So there have actually been thefts at museums for uh, places for people trying to get these feathers and use them. Hi, my name is Nora Moriarty. I'm on the curatorial staff here at the Putnam Museum. Welcome to Play the Story of Toys. This is a temporary exhibit we had from the holiday season and it's going to be here through the summer to look at the role that toys and games have in our lives. So one thing we know about the role of toys and games in human culture is that it is universal. We see evidence of toys and games throughout just about every society that we have evidence of, no matter the time period, no matter how developed the society. One thing that we've found is that toys often represent future roles that children will be taking on, and these often conform to gender roles. So little girls may play with toys that represent tasks that they will be learning in their future life. The same goes for little boys. 
Here in this display, we have some Native American Mississippian culture pottery, which is miniaturized versions of the pottery that a little girl's mother or aunt may make for the family. The style would match the type of style that her mother is making. Now the mother may have made this pottery for her daughter as a gift, or perhaps the little girl would have learned how to make pottery next to her mother while making these little toys. It's a great low pressure way for a child to learn these skills that she'll need when she's an adult. Also we found that girls toys in most cultures tend to lend more to the domestic tasks that they'll need. They often have to do with nurturing, feeding, and food gathering. Little boys, on the other hand, often play with toys that represent uh, more aggressive or adventurous life tasks, such as hunting. Sometimes we find grave goods in children's burials, such as miniaturized weapons or miniaturized tools. Even things like this wooden toy boat from the Philippines represents tasks and skills the boy will need to know later in life, such as seafaring or navigation. These themes are true for all cultures all over the world and we start seeing grave goods in children's burials uh, representing toys thousands of years ago. In fact, when I was working in an archaeological dig in Greece, we discovered an Iron Age barrier of a child where a small ceramic cup with a slotted rim was discovered. It's actually a 4,000 year old sippy cup. So these sorts of things that children would have used every single day, would have treasured, are often found in the burials, and that's how archaeologists figure out what may or may not have been toys. Marbles are another ancient toy that have been around since human civilization. We find evidence of hand-carved stone spheres representing marbles since around 2500 BCE. We know that they were played in lots of old world civilizations. In fact, they're featured in some Roman literature and stone reliefs. It's a game that's not only played by children, but also into adulthood as well. Now, something I find kind of funny is that when we have a display out here with marbles, when children come in with their parents or grandparents, the kids get excited to see marbles, they recognize them but they don't actually even realize that there's a game with rules for how you play. Uh, the grandparents and parents try to explain it to them, and the children are always just a little confused by it. They've never heard it before. It's not part of their culture. What they seem to be interested in is actually collecting marbles. Uh, when I used to work in the gift shop, we had a giant display of colorful marbles, all shapes and sizes and designs, so the kids would get so excited to find their favorites or get one of each, and it's almost like they're collecting Pokemon but it's such an ancient old game that we've played for generations upon generations and it's really cool to see grandparents and parents passing down that knowledge to modern children. Now marbles is a game that's traditionally played outside uh, and one thing we've done here in the display is we've used a hula hoop to represent the circle that marbles would be played inside. Uh, we're working with what we've got. Now hula hoops are pretty interesting because unlike marbles, that's actually considered a pretty short term fad type of toy. It's something played outside, it gives children exercise, uh, outdoor plays, incredibly important for kids because it allows them to practice skills in an entirely different environment than they experience in home. They also get sunlight and fresh air as well. We find that children that play outside actively are actually on average healthier than children who typically play inside. Now the hula hoop was created in the 1950s by a company called Whammo, and it was a copy of an Australian idea. So in Australia, before that, they had hula hoops made out of bamboo, but Whammo recognized the marketability of this and created the mass market plasticized version of the hula hoop. And in the 1950s, they sold about 25 million in about four months. Since then, hula hoops have lost a little bit of their popularity, but they're still occasionally marketed as a good exercise tool, and it's even sometimes used for weight loss methods. Now let's move on to some of the more infamous or dangerous toys that we know of. So like me, you have, may have had an easy bake oven when you were younger. Uh, it was tons of fun and great role playing and it was so cool that you could produce your own treats to have for snacks. The easy bake oven was created in 1963 by Kenner and it was actually originally marketed to both boys and girls. It was intended to be a gender neutral toy. But very quickly they learned that marketing was going to be a lot more effective if they targeted it to a female audience. Now the Easy Bake Oven is a lot of fun and didn't cook things at the traditional oven temperatures, but it was still hot enough to burn. 
Now the little slot that you would pull the cookies or cakes out of is just large enough for tiny fingers to get in there and try and fish out that one stray cookie. We found out that Easy Bake Ovens are responsible for at least 77 burns and one partially amputated finger. In fact, in 2007, there was a recent recall of a certain type of Easy Bake Oven. It's gone through lots of remodels throughout the years to try and make it safe for children, but it seems to still be a bit of a problem. Now, one of the most infamous dangerous toys of all time is the Jarts. Now, this was conceived as a product for children that was meant to be an outdoor version of the darts game. They featured large weighted steel pointy tip projectiles that children were meant to throw across their lawn and into a small circle set in their yard. Now, a slew of immediate injuries and accidents caused the company to try to remarket it to adults only. And they even had to slap a warning label on the box about the potential fatal injuries that could happen. However, in 1988, the Consumer Product Safety Commission did a study and found that JARTs were responsible for over 6,000 emergency room visits and several deaths. They issued a ban on the toy in 1988, but many people held on to their jarts. They kept them around their house. In fact, about 10 years after that, in 1997, a small boy was playing with jarts and ended up with one piercing his skull. After this happened, the Consumer Product Safety Commission decided to take the unprecedented action of reissuing the ban. They even put out a statement saying, that parents should destroy the lawn darts immediately. This had never happened before, and luckily they're still banned today. But let's move on to a happier subject. Creative toys that allow children to express their artistic abilities are a wonderful way for a child to build confidence and social skills. Being able to create something in a low pressure setting, especially with a material that can be used again and again, is vital to helping a child become more confident in themselves and their abilities to create. One of the most popular creative toys of all time was actually discovered by accident. In the 1950s, Joe McVicker was trying to create a new type of putty that would clean wallpaper without leaving stains. Now he created the putty, but unfortunately it didn't work out for him. The marketing didn't work and it just didn't sell. In his frustration, he lent the putty to his sister-in-law who was a teacher. She brought it to her classroom and found that the students loved it. It was a cheap substitute for modeling clay and was more pliable, so the children never got tired of playing with it. They could create scenes and figures, build them up, and then break them back down again. Now we know Play-Doh as one of the most popular creative toys of all time. I've played with it, I'm sure you've played with it as well, and it continues to sell today. Another one of the incredibly famous toys that we have on display here was also discovered by accident. In 1943, Richard James, an engineer, was hired by the Navy to create a system that would stabilize ships in choppy waters. Unfortunately, he did not succeed in his task. He tried a spring system that was not effective. As he was working on this project, he grew frustrated, and legend has it that in his frustration, he knocked one of the springs off of his desk and then was shocked to watch it walk across the floor and down the hallway. And thus, the Slinky was born. By 1945, he and his wife realized what they had. They had an amazing and fascinating toy that children and adults would love. They wanted it to be manufactured and ready to sell for the Christmas season, but they needed help. So on a shoestring budget of a $500 loan, they manufactured the first few hundred slinkies. And they sold out within minutes. To this day, millions upon millions of slinkies have been sold worldwide and is still one of the most recognizable toys of all time, and all due to an engineering accident. We actually have some local toy manufacturers here at the Quad Cities. In 1920, Fred Lundell founded the Moline Press Steel Company in East Moline. He was making steel parts for automobiles, different vehicles, industrial equipment, and he ended up creating toys just for his son, Buddy. He wanted toys for Buddy that were durable, would last a long time, and were of high quality. 
the neighborhood kids started to notice the cool toys that Buddy had, and so Fred realized that he had another market on his hands. So he started creating Buddy L toys for kids in the neighborhood. Nowadays, Buddy L toys is known internationally for high quality, durable toys. Another local toy manufacturer that we have is the Strombeck Becker Company. It's now known as Strombecker. So they produce wooden toys, and this came out of the Depression era. The company was founded in 1919 and comes from Moline. And during the Depression, they started making wooden toy kits. You could build trains, you could build planes with these kits, and it was a lower cost kind of toy since so many people were underdressed during the Depression. Later, they started making dollhouse furniture as well. Historians estimate that at the time of the birth of our nation, a child was considered truly fortunate to have maybe 10 toys. But today, the toy industry is booming all over the world, and the average American child is estimated to have around 200 toys to themselves. Places like Toys R Us created a specialized toy industry that rose up after the baby boomer generation. Specialized toys for gender roles, outdoor play, indoor play, creative play, and educational play have created an industry that is worth billions. And while companies like Toys R Us and Babies R Us have lost their business, many toy industry companies have actually moved online, and now the internet is responsible for the majority of toy sales across the world. I want to thank you for joining me today in our exhibit, Play the Story of Toys. This is an amazing exhibit that we're so excited to have, once again, through the end of the summer. If you come to the Quad City region, I hope that you come in to check it out. Most of the toys in this exhibit come from our collection, but actually a large part of them also come from local collectors, as well as volunteers and employees at the Putnam Museum. Our collection is 150 years old, and toys are a part of that, but we found that appealing to collectors and volunteers really helped fill out the collection, and it also showed us what people are passionate about when it comes to toys. This display behind me was created by the Putnam Guild, a community of volunteers who have helped the museum for decades. We're so happy to have their toys and everyone else's toys on display here at the Putnam, and I hope we're able to see it. Hi, welcome to the Putnam Museum's Ancient Egypt Gallery called Unearthing Ancient Egypt. My name is Christina Castell, and I will be your guide here today to this exhibit. We have two mummies in our museum collection. Is that astonishing or what? A little museum here in the Midwest of Iowa. I tell you, when I'm out meeting other museum professionals and tell them we have two mummies, they're like, in Iowa? Yes! <laughs> Iowa is progressive and we do have mummies in our collection. So um, we're going to meet both those mummies today and hear the stories about how they actually came here because that's the interesting part. First, we're going to wander over and look at this mummy here our wrapped mummy. He came to us in 1896. He was purchased by Charles Fickey. Um, he was one of our um, former directors of the museum. He was a mayor and an attorney. And although he was an attorney, he did not get his money from being an attorney. He got it from early land purchases here in the Quad Cities. Um, so he had a lot of money so that he had a special lifestyle. And he was aware of it. He was a poor German immigrant. He'd come here from the old world when he was a, a child, lived on the family farm, and um, tried several different careers. Uh, for a while, he worked as a shopkeeper, a clerk in a store downtown, and to save money, he would sleep under the counter at night. So this is the man who went and purchased this mummy. He actually was visiting Egypt in 1896 and went to the Cairo Museum and said, I'd like to buy a mummy. Can you imagine that? If anybody walked into our museum today and said, yes, I'd like to buy your mummy, we'd be like, there's the door, folks. <laughs> but um, in, at that time in Cairo, in the museum, they were mummy-rich and money poor. 
So in order to have the money to preserve the important mummies, the pharaohs, the queens, all of that, um, they would sell um, mummies that were not considered important at that time. And so um, they had this mummy, and behind me here, this black coffin. And so um, Mr. Figgy picked out this coffin. He liked it because it had hieroglyphs on it. And he thought, well, won't that be fun to take that home to uh, Davenport? And then we can have the fun of translating it. So he said, this coffin, and then they went back to the mummy room. Imagine that, a mummy room. And they brought back mummy after mummy after mummy till they finally found one that was actually going to fit in this coffin. So that became the pair that we had. Um, for many years, people thought that these two went together because, hey, they came together, right? Um, Fortunately, nowadays we know a little bit more about um, ancient Egypt and the mummies. And looking at this mummy, um, it doesn't fit with the style of this coffin. This coffin is very firmly 18th dynasty. And if you know a little bit about Egypt, you may know that that's the dynasty that King Tut lived in. Um, so this is uh, maybe 100 years earlier than King Tut. It also um, would have been purchased and owned by someone who was aware of Tut's family, which is kind of cool. Um, they, everybody knew who the Pharaoh was, and everybody knew the Pharaoh's name. So if this person didn't know them directly, they would have known the family. Um, and the interesting thing about this coffin is, um, in addition to its beauty, there's no name on it. There's a gap in the hieroglyphs right here, right here, um, right here where the decedent's name should be written down, the name of the person who had died who was the occupant of this coffin. Now, why was that? There's other reasons that it could be. A, you, first thought is, I said, oh, he must have been a very bad man. Um, and uh, they didn't, because in ancient Egypt, the way to immortality is to have your name remembered and spoken. So if his name was not written down on his coffin, it couldn't be spoken. So one would think, oh, he must have been bad. And so, uh, that's what some people think. I think, um, having some experience with um, burials, excavating burials as an archaeologist, uh, my thought is that the um, coffin makers save themselves a few drachma or whatever the uh, type of um, currency was in ancient Egypt by not writing the name on. It would have taken them a scholar because only about, I think it's 4% of Egypt could read and write. So very few people, and all the elite too, only the priests, the pharaoh, the pharaoh's family could read and write ancient hieroglyphs. So um, the family wouldn't have known, likely, that their loved one's name was not on the coffin. So the priest probably felt pretty secure, saying, oh, no, well, we won't write it on this coffin. You know, they won't know the difference. So that's what I think is why this coffin doesn't have a name on it. It could also have been a demo model, a demonstration model by a, a coffin maker that somehow somebody just purchased and they, they used it without putting a name on. Who knows? Um, but it's interesting to think about. Now, when we look at this mummy, He's elaborately wrapped in this sort of basket weave type of pattern. And um, so we wonder, where'd that come from? The interesting thing is that this type of weaving is not Egyptian. It's the type of weaving that was done by the Greeks and the Romans who both conquered um, Egypt. Alexander the Great conquered Egypt um, around 400, six, four to 600 um, BC and uh, they occupied um, Egypt, served as pharaohs. In fact, Cleopatra was the last of the Greek pharaohs. And um, they, it was a family line called the Ptolemy line. So she was one of the Ptolemies who was a ruler of ancient Egypt. Um, and this guy belongs to that same time period too. Now, the interesting thing about him is that when we took him in for CT scans, and believe me, we didn't know it was for sure that it was a male at the time, um, we discovered that his bones are all broken up in his chest cavity. So I thought, being a non-Egyptologist, um, 
my first thought was, oh my gosh, he maybe had a chariot crash and you know that's what killed him. But fortunately, we hooked up with an Egyptologist from Pennsylvania and he's like, Chris, Chris, it's not that. It's um, that the body was badly embalmed. Um, when it's all wrapped up, if it's not fully dried out, gases develop on the inside cavities and they, there's no place to go. So poof, it just has to implode and breaks all the bones in the body and fractures the skin, etc. cetera. So um, it, like this, my belief with this coffin, um, this was another thing that the embalmers did to save a, a few pennies, is that they took them out of the natron salts to dry them out too soon because it was cheaper. They probably had somebody else waiting to go in. So they took him out and wrapped him up and thinking, ooh, nobody will ever know, not realizing that someday we would have CT scans and discover what they had done. So this poor man was badly embalmed, but look at how beautifully he's wrapped. He would never know it. Um, when we had him going through the CT machine, uh, the radiologist, uh, Dr. Burkow, was um, reading the uh, scans as he was going through, and he knew that we didn't know what the sex was for sure. And so uh, when he went through, uh, Dr. Burkow turned to me at a certain point in the CT scan and said, it's a boy. And I just started laughing, it was so funny. So male mummy um, from the Ptolemy period of uh, when the Greeks were uh, ruling Egypt, 18th dynasty coffin, not a set. So now let's go on and meet our female mummy. So meet our female mummy. She's the mummy that was for formerly known as Isis Neferit. This coffin is the coffin that she came in and on it, um, when we translated the hieroglyphs, we revealed that her name was Isis Neferit and she was a chantress in a temple. Now, um, at the time that this coffin would have been produced, uh, she would have been um, a chantress in the temple would have been uh, a young woman um, who was unmarried, had no children, etc. So when we sent this mummy for CT scans, that's what we were expecting to find is a young 18 to 20 year old girl, chaste, uh, virginal, etc. And she looks it too. She's got beautiful, slim uh, bones and lovely long fingers. So we really thought that's what we were going to discover. But the CT scans revealed that this is not a young girl. This is an older woman, 40s to 50s even. Grandma, not just a mother, a mommy mummy, but a grandma mummy. And um, so we were very surprised. And not only that, but her pubic synthesis in the front of the, the pubic bone, um, there's two bones that come together like this. Fortunately for a woman giving birth, they spread open like this that allows um, the baby to pass more freely through and they don't always come back together perfectly aligned. And that's what happened with her. Her pubic symphysis is offset, indicating that she had one or more children. So um, our lovely female mummy here was not what we expected. And again, we turned to our Egyptologist and said, you know, what's going on here? And he looked at her funerary mask and he recognized her funerary mask. In fact, that's how we found him, is because he was interested in her funerary mask. It fit the style of the funerary masks that he was studying from Akmim, Egypt. He was studying a cemetery there, and um, the cemetery, the facial masks, the colors, the style, all was consistent with her funerary mask. That was a surprise to us. She was not a Theban woman because this coffin is the style that's made in Thebes in uh, the dynasty following um, Ramesses the Great. That would be the 21st dynasty. Well, this woman and that cemetery date to much later than that. In fact, it's about 600 BC, right before the Greeks come and conquer um, Egypt is when she died. So again, we have a pair that don't match up. So did, where did these two come from? Now that's the interesting story. 
B.J. Palmer from Palmer Chiropractic owned this mummy and this coffin. He had bought it at an auction, and this auction was selling off materials that were confiscated during World War II. They established a, a law during World War II that said that people could um, be kicked out of the country if they were known spies. And living in New York City at the onset of World War II was Baron Max von Oppenheim, a German citizen, a German royal or noble citizen. Um, and he had been an archeologist, never excavated in Egypt, so I don't know where he got her from, but um, he had excavated in the Middle East. So uh, here he was at the onset of World War II, um, living in an apartment with her. And um, so he was deported because he was a known spy from World War I. And because of that, all of his property was confiscated, and after the war, she was sold as um, part of this law that allowed the government to take possession. So the first person who purchased her was a magician. Now you can imagine what his magic trick would have been. He probably would have had a young, beautiful live girl lying down on a table, and magic words, poof, she became the mummy. So, um, his wife was so frightened by the curse of the mummy, the curse that came out during um, when Tut was excavated. That's when people started talking about the curse. But she was so frightened of that that she told her husband, nope, you cannot own this, you know, I'm afraid the curse will kill you. So he turned it back to the government and B.J. Palmer, being B.J. Palmer, if you know Palmer Chiropractic, he wouldn't think anything of a curse like that. In fact, he'd probably say, go ahead and per curse me. <laughs> I'll fix it with chiropractic because, of course, chiropractic was what his family had invented. And um, he was such a firm believer and such a proponent of chiropractic that I'm sure he didn't feel fear anything. So he purchased this coffin and this mummy. Um, he was very interested in her spine, of course, being a chiropractor. So um, he studied her and she lived at the college until he died in 1965 is when she passed to us with his will. Um, he willed her to us and as well as some of his other worldly treasures. So uh, she came here and we translated the coffin, as I mentioned, and believed her to be Isis Nipparit. And so she was for all the time between um, 1965 and um, when she was discovered through CT scans to be somebody different. So unfortunately, we don't know who she is and we don't know where Isis Nipparit is but hopefully Isis Neferit's body survived and um, she is someplace. So saying her name, Isis Neferit, we're giving her additional life. And um, our beautiful woman here, um, a beautiful woman would be a Nefer. Nefer is beautiful. Um, um, Nefertiti means a beautiful woman has come. So um, this Nefer woman here, um, we don't know her name, but I just always refer to her as Nefer. So hopefully, since she is so lovely, her name would have had Nefer in it, and we can help her live on in her afterlife as well, too. So please come to the Putnam Museum sometime. Have a look at these mummies in person, up close and personal. And we've got additional artifacts in this gallery that I know you will enjoy to see as well. So thank you so much for stopping in at the Putnam today. and. Um, allowing me to show you a couple of our wonderful, wonderful treasures. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up. Uh, Nora, Chris, if you'd like to introduce yourself while I invite our attendees to turn on their video and then we'll go ahead and get started with some question and answers. My name is <laughs> um, I'm Chris Chandler. I'm the Curator of Natural Science here at the Putnam. I'm actually a paleontologist, a vertebrate paleontologist, but uh, over the years uh, I have handled everything from uh, chemical elements to playing with dinosaurs and mammoths and mastodons and birds. 
And my name is Nora Moriarty. Um, I'm the newest member of the curatorial staff here at the Putnam Museum. My background is in archaeology, particularly Greek and Roman archaeology. But since working at the Putnam, uh, I've I, I expanded. <laughs> Uh, you'll never know what you're learning about, whether it's dinosaurs, astronomy, toy, toys, <laughs> taxidermy. So, <laughs> yeah, we're so glad you could all make it today. Perfect. All right. I haven't seen any questions come through the chat yet, but feel free to uh, turn your audio on, ask those questions live, or if you're not as comfortable showing your screen um, or talking live, you can also put them in the chat and I'll read them out to the group as well. So at this time, we'll open the floor. I see we've got Alice and Vicki on. Hi, guys. Perfect. Are there any questions about the specific exhibits that anybody has? I had a, a question on the birds. The um, I'm in Chicago. I'm about a mile from the lake, so I think that's another flyway, right? As, yeah. Um, and I was wondering about the, um, you know, your your exhibit has birds that are local to the Quad Cities, but is that how much is that like a micro local thing? How much is there, uh, you know, that of that is due to the Mississippi? Um, how much would that generalize across to say the other side of, of uh, Northern Illinois? Well, um, we do get specific local things on this side, but we also, it, it, there's the flyway itself actually is um, not just the Mississippi River, but it includes part of the Ohio, Ohio River and part of the Missouri River. So there is a large expanse that it's covering. Um, just to let you know, in our collection, we, one of the largest collections that I got at one point was uh, apparently there was some sort of fog over by Chicago and a bunch of birds ended up hitting wires and things. And so we ended up with a fairly decent sized collection from the Chicago area, actually. Um, but the other thing interesting about where we are situated here, yeah. right on the Mississippi and on the Iowa side is that we're right where a bunch of different populations mix. So you have Western populations and Eastern populations both mixing here. So we get a little bit of everything is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> nice. But I could say in different proportions because I found it interesting when I was looking at stuff is how in Illinois, there will be certain animals that are listed as endangered, particularly certain birds listed as endangered. And on the Iowa side, we don't even think of them as being threatened. So it does make a little difference that river sitting there in between. Mm -hmm. Did any of our attendees have the lawn darts? I kept thinking that the entire time during Nora's presentation. Did anybody have those? Attention guests, we are now feeding for the Sorry. new park screening of Super Power Dog in the Giant Screen Theater. If you would like to see this movie, please stop by our ticket office in the lawn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Sorry.
Yeah, fantastic company and that local connection. We always love that whenever we're looking for things for the button, we're looking for something with a local connection. And actually after the toy exhibit went live and we had opened it for the holiday season, we were contacted by a family who, aren't they based out of Arizona now? Uh, one's, in, one's in Idaho and the other's in... But they're not local anymore. Not local. The family has moved on. <laughs> but they read about our toy exhibit and then were inspired to donate their Strombecker toy collection to us. So it, it's really cool to see how people are inspired by the museum exhibits to start thinking about what they have at home um, and start making connections. I thought when you were talking about, when you started talking about the Play Doh, that you were going to tell us about Silly Putty because you'd said it was like for taking. If you wanted to take paint off of or marks off of paint or something? Yeah, the Play-Doh's purpose was originally to be wallpaper putty to clean wallpaper. And then Silly Putty, Silly Putty was originally meant to be a rubber substitute. So like those are two examples of toys being discovered kind of by mistake or not for their original intentions. That is very similar stories between Silly Putty and Play-Doh. Hmm. I would like to uh, make a comment for the bird lady. Put your, put your hand up, whoever you are. <laughs> the bird. <laughs> but, and, your, and your name is? Chris, Chris Chandler. Chris, this is Fred. I live out in San Diego and I am a volunteer at the Anza Borrego Desert State Park where among other things we have 330 different species of bird. And I would like to invite you sometime to come out and I'll hook you up with a birder. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we get people come from around the world, literally every, I can't think of a country we haven't had people show up from to see birds because among other things, we're on the Pacific flyway. Yeah. So we can pretty well predict when various migratory species are coming through town. And, and we're right at the edge of the Salton Sea. So there's lots of crops for them to eat and things like that. And they'll stay usually four or five days and then take off. And, and various species have a very interesting group of what I'll, I guess the better way to say it is groupies. <laughs> The Swenson Hawks people come in and we, we even have grandstands where they sit and watch the Hawks come in. And um, anyway, I, I don't know if you have it, but when, I can always tell a birder when they come into the, the visitor center because they have a pair of usually two or three thousand uh, dollar binoculars around their neck and they have a leather bound notebook and many of them now have gone to a leather bound uh, iPad or something like that. Oh. And a very specific list of birds they wanna see. And they'll say, okay, where can we see this bird? Well, the park is the size of the state of Rhode Island and I usually tell them anywhere they wanna be. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and we have a couple of birds and, and one of them is called Lecomps warbler that only appears in that area. And, and the other interesting thing about that particular one is they never fly higher than five feet off the ground. So they have a, a bunch of groupies as you might well imagine. <laughs> the, the birding world is very, very interesting. And, um, and but the, it's a very intense group and uh, when I get a, a birder come in, I always hand them off to one of our birders. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Because they get really upset if you don't, can't answer their questions. <laughs> now, had you ever heard of this birds aren't real campaign? Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> uh, we, we've discovered this since the bird exhibit opened. Um, some Somebody <laughs> was um, dropping off stickers and information in our bird exhibit that say birds aren't real. And it's part of this kind of joking conspiracy theory that all the birds were killed off by, by Nixon. Richard Nixon, Nixon killed off all the birds and placed them with surveillance robots. <laughs> 
and we, we've learned a lot about the conspiracy theories <laughs> since we opened the sticks of it. But our thing is that we can put a sign up and say our birds are real because most of them predate the 60s. So. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to see some real birds, you can look at the hot dog. dog. <laughs> The uh, Anza Borrego Desert State Park has a real big uh, website if you want to go online and see when the various birds come through. And I'll also say that most of the pictures you ever see of a desert in bloom is our desert. All the other desert parks co-opt our pictures. <laughs> And it's because we have very large fields, like up to a thousand acres that go into bloom, where most places only have, you know, the size of a football field. So, but no one's ever heard of us. And uh, which well, is- been, also, Yeah, I've been to San Diego and I don't recall hearing about you. So. 90% of the people in San Diego County who live here have never heard of it. <laughs> and, it and it's 20% of the land in San Diego County. Attention guests, this is the last call for the three part. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, we had another little announcement coming through. We managed to oh. <laughs> mute it. <laughs> I guess the mute doesn't stay on. <laughs> um, I was going to say, our big thing here um, is eagles, of course. The yes. Bald eagle. And we've had bald eagle days for years and years and years. And having grown up, uh, you know, a couple hundred miles up the river from here as a kid, I never saw eagles. So uh, that's one of the things we like to talk about in the exhibit is that there are things that we can do, things that we have done. We have proof that we actually can make a change. We can actually do things that help animals survive and, and actually multiply. So uh, that's one of the things we always bring up here is that's like, look, when I grew up, you didn't see any eagles. You were lucky if you saw an eagle, you know, by the time you were 10 or 15, you might've seen an eagle, you know? And now, yeah. Everywhere you go, there are baldies out there. It's great. We, we have golden eagles out here. Yes, you have them all. We get a, we get golden once in a great while when they stray <laughs> out of where they belong. <laughs> actually have a, a golden in the collection. Um, that's one of the other things that we talk about in, in some of this is that explaining to people that there are laws that affect birds and that like you simply can't just pick up a bird, you can't pick up feathers, things like that, because we actually have all sorts of permits so that we can actually have the birds in the collection. Well, thank you very much for your, your bird lecture. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat as well. Um, can you each tell us your favorite artifact in the Putnam collection? Ooh, that's a big question. I don't know. That's a toughie. Yeah, that is tough. <laughs> that's a real tough. And it changes a lot, too. <laughs> like, for a while, I probably would have said Isis Nefreet, the mummy. You know, she's one of my favorites. And then the other day, I was looking through a West African art collection. Um, we're planning an exhibit for that in spring 2022. And I came across an absolutely delightful brass lion that's about, you know, could fit in the palm of my hand. It's, it's about this big. And the way it was carved, it reminded me of my dog. As my dog is the ears and the tuft and everything. And so that became my favorite for a little while. And it changes a lot a lot of times when we're actually working on an in-house exhibit. Mm -hmm. It's like suddenly you find something that you didn't know. Um, I recently came across, we have Japanese um, glass floats, fishing floats. They're these great big giant glass bubbles. And they are the coolest looking things. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, natural science wise, you know, um, we have we have an old enough collection. They got all sorts of interesting things. Um, I'd probably say the glass sponges are one of the most fascinating things. They are really cool. Uh, it looks like looks like a, a tube spun out of glass, you know, like fiber optic glass, that sort of thing. And they look very much, they have interesting patterns, very intricate. They look like somebody's sculpture. And I think that's very cool. Are they functional? They are, excuse me? Are they functional? Uh, I mean, they, they were actually, yes, it's, it's a, a, it's a sponge. sponge. They're, um, they're Venus, really, what oh. are they called? Vena something or others. I can't think of the actual, the, the general name, but they create, instead of using um, uh, calcium carbonate to make a skeleton, they actually use um, what is basically essentially glass hmm. uh, out of water. They pull it out and create these beautiful things. Um, they, normally what sets inside the sponge, there's like a little, uh, there's a couple little shrimp that end up spending their lives in the, and so that's why they're like a, they're like a Venus 
love basket or something. I can't remember the actual term, but it's like those two uh, little guys, the shrimps live their entire life basically in the sponge and they had a beautiful home. <laughs> One of the, the staff favorites, I think a lot of us kind of fell in love with, we just opened a new gallery called the World Culture Gallery. Mm -hmm. And in it, we have a, uh, what, what, what we call a leopard chair, but it's, it's a, not a replica. It's a reproduction, reproduction during the, um, the Tut, when everybody went crazy for Tuts, like in the 20s, the teens and 20s, I think. Yeah. But it, it's made out of uh, real pelts from either a cheetah it's or a, a cheetah. leopard. It's a, a cheetah. cheetah. It's a cheetah. <laughs> but it's it's very beautiful and it's very uh, ornately inlaid with pearl and it, it, the fur is just absolutely gorgeous and the face of the cat is a very friendly cat face. It's and so nice a lot of the staffers who've been coming through to check out the new gallery have said that they really, really love that. And I, I really love it too. <laughs> Everybody wants to pet the kitty. <laughs> yeah, they can. <laughs> awesome. Um, what sort of topics are covered in the exhibits and how often do the exhibits change at the Putnam? Oh, goodness. Um, one of the things we like to say about us, if you've ever been to the Field Museum in Chicago, we pretty much cover all the topics they do except for DNA studies, except we have them on the smaller collection. Um, so we have, um, there's a couple halls that are natural history halls. One of them is basically about mammals and we're switching that over to talk about um, threatened and endangered species, climate change, that sort of thing. Um, it includes two large dioramas uh, with one's got polar bears and the other one's got an African uh, watering hole. So think about the animals you would see there and you'll see very large animals there. Um, the other is like, it's um, an immersive exhibit where you walk through and you're suddenly in a forest and it takes you through the habitats that we find here around the Quad City. So it's like all sorts of animals, uh, there's over something like 90 birds in the trees in the, that exhibit um, and all the different animals that you might run into. It takes you through um, the wetlands, into the forest, to the prairie, and then even an urban setting. So that's quite neat. Um, then we have a, a history hall, a local history hall where it takes you through the history of the Quad Cities using objects from um, a little bit on Native Americans and then it goes into basically settling around the Quad Cities and up into I think it ends what, in the 60s now or 70s. It's going to give you rehab. Yeah, it, it's, yeah getting, we're updating it, it. it's getting updated, so it's going to actually go farther along. Yeah, our permanent exhibits don't change as often. Then we have certain halls or exhibit halls inside the museum that we use for seasonal exhibits. And well, before the year 2020, we changed what twice a year in each of those. Usually, at least twice a year. And it, it kind of depends. It can change depending on whether or not we have like a, a traveling exhibit in or if we're doing an in-house exhibit. And so now we have a, a, let's see, one, two, three, four temporary exhibits, maybe? We wow. have- Innovator is supposed to be- yeah. Like spur four, yeah. yeah. So right now uh, we have, it's um, OMG, and it's uh, about the periodic table, mm -hmm. which we do take the periodic table through and use objects to explain the periodic table as to like, okay, did you know that this has iron in it or this has fluoride in it or something, you know? So lots of fun with that. Um, we have um, toys is a temporary exhibit. Uh, the bird exhibit that I worked on is a temporary exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, we have one on faces. Yeah, that's right, the small gallery upstairs. The small gallery upstairs yeah. is faces, which it was linked to an exhibit that was at the art museum mm -hmm. where it was portraiture. And so this was the idea of uh, what ancient people, different societies look at when they think of faces and how they portray faces. Uh, which one am I missing? I'm sure I'm missing something. Oh, the new hall. Yeah, World Culture Gallery. We're, we're with, new World Culture Gallery now. Yeah, which will be part permanent and then part changing over. So like I said, in the spring, we're going to have a West African exhibit that is actually going to move into the World Culture Gallery uh, in the changeable uh, units in there. And then, you know what we're forgetting? The okay. Science Center. The Science Center. <laughs> we have a Science Center too. So. Yeah, and a theater. <laughs> yeah, the Science Center is like interactive based and we're actually just doing a push right now to get more um, historical connections into our Science Center. Um, so that's an ongoing effort. Great. Um, we have a comment from Vicki Young just saying, thank you so much for an interesting program. We'll have to bring our grandson to Putnam in the summer. Um, and then Jim Wilson said, I may have missed it due to a doorbell, but what about North American Indian artifacts? I know there are a lot from the area. Okay, yeah, we actually, in our permanent exhibit that's about local history, we actually do talk about um, 
human culture in the Midwest and our particular area from, um, you know, nomadic prehistory into, uh, you know, European settlers arriving, Colonel Davenport, Antoine Leclerc, if you're familiar with this area, those are some of the more prominent European settlers that interacted with the Native American population. Uh, the other curator, uh, Christina Castell, uh, wasn't able to join us today, but she actually specializes in Native American cultures and archaeology. And so we have a lot of information in that exhibit about the Mississippian cultures um, and Black what Treaty. the Black Hawk Treaty. Yeah, that, that's a big one. So um, how uh, the, well, we'll get into the legalities <laughs> of the treaties. But yeah, we actually in our collection have the original Black Hawk Treaty. I think it's one of two or three existing copies. Perfect. All right, so um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions in the chat. Rachel Evans, who also is an associate at the Putnam, she actually just put the link into um, the chat. So if you'd like to check out their website, please feel free. Um, Vicki said, when will these recorded Zooms be shown? Um, they'll be all on our website next week. So everything has been recorded and will be available on our website. Um, just to kind of wrap things up today, I just want to say, say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Nora, Chris, and Rachel, and the other Chris who was not able to be here with us today for putting together a great presentation for us um, and getting to see the exhibits and what's new at the Putnam. Um, just as a reminder, our next Golden Scots event is going to begin at four o'clock. We have a presentation titled From Attacking Corporate Crime to Playing Live Gigs with Bill Mockestead, class of 73. And then also yesterday, we reopened up a morning session of our golf outing. So if anybody's interested in signing up for that, that's also available on our website. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see most of you at four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.